Hello boys and girls. In this video I will discuss a small Python script that allows one to sample data from an arbitrary distribution basically. It's extremely generic, one dimensional distribution. We want to sample data. Um, but I will make it basically in the most tedious hands-on way. I will even have a short part where I generate the random numbers myself. And the point of it is how can you get from like binary yes no signals to actually sampling data from a distribution like this right so here we have a histogram um this is just you know i just googled histogram that uh, data goes from 0 to 20 or not 25 even and there is for example a, a particular weight on around the number two or three but then there's a much less weight around the number 21 right and so how do you um random generate um, values that follow that distribution in the sense that if you do it a million times then the 5 will show up maybe twice as often as the 15 right so this is going to get implemented in this way in this in this video and the ba basically there's two parts to it so on the one hand how do you get from uh, the, as I said, the binary random data to uh, um, random data that follows a distribution. And also the whole thing is motivated by there being some talks, uh, at least in the circles where I frequent about energy-based models. Here, the important sentence here in often this Wikipedia page is that uh, generative models learn an underlying data distribution by analyzing a sampling data set. Once trained, uh, the generative model can produce other data sets that, um, that also match the da data distribution. So the data distribution um, corresponds to some function or some histogram in this case. And um, this is a, like a, a particular um, learning um, model class we're not going to discuss this in in any detail the motivation comes from this company uh, extropic releasing some light paper in which they like very roughly sketch out and um, drop a few buzzwords um, how they want to um, have a physics-based um, approach to sample data basically from um, distributions of their choice. There's not too much detail, it's not exactly clear which distributions um, uh, they can choose to sample from, but um, given the underlying physics you can make some estimates or get, get some idea. Um, on this website you know you see some um, nice image of distributions and there there's some motivations regarding more complicated distributions than Gaussians and so on and so forth. Um, this will also make it to this video. In particular, there is then an analogy, an, an analogy here in the middle of this light paper with Brownian motion. And so I'm, I'm at, the, at the end of the video, after I discuss the Python script stuff, I will come back and uh, connect the Brownian motion and the physics to um, this more semiconductor heavy approaches there. Okay, so um, all of this I come back at the, at the end of the video, um, but for my motivation here, I have here, I think this is a stable diffusion generated picture of a car. There's like, I just Googled, you know, uh, um, generated pictures of cars. There's some, some cars here, okay, and, and let's say um, you played now the role of uh, the um, of the ML tool, and you decide you you draw a, a car, and um, then like to act like the machine, you basically say, okay, which color uh, should I draw this this car, right? So I have here um, color wheel. There's a bunch of colors. Let, let's let's reduce ourselves to this finite amount of, of colors. Uh, and you use so that's I don't know how many these are like maybe five times uh, 10 50 60 uh, different colors and maybe you have an intuition which colors uh, sports cars let's say usually have maybe you know you say it's much more likely that they have some red 
uh, then that they are I don't know light blue or something or violet this is very very rare so you can already see that like just from your experience there is some distribution of uh, which colors are typical right so you may assign uh, some high value here uh, like a high weight that you should maybe chose this this sort of color and maybe yellow is also not too bad but fewer here and so on and so forth so on all these sort of data set i'm just choosing this as a random data set you that you have some uh, distribution over these discrete values there and uh, once you have the distribution one once you have you know formalize your intuition maybe write down like what is much more likely than this then you can uh, translate this to some some distribution right so here i used this uh, paint tool um, and I just drew some uh, um, distribution like freely, this blue line. Uh, on purpose, I didn't draw like a normal distribution or some uniform distributions, but there's like, it's a little bit more complicated. And you can say, you know, maybe, maybe this is like the red area, this is the blue area, and um, maybe uh, violet here is, is particularly rare. You, you assign basically, um, these colors to the distribution say you know oh this this red uh, here the this is the peak is like doubt should be double as likely to be chosen for my picture than this and then you sample like one color according to this distribution and then draw a, a car um, accordingly and if you have this distribution and let, let's say you want to be realistic the distribution of colors reflects uh, what is out there in your city and you do this hundred thousand times you draw a hundred thousand pictures then the distribution of c colors of your cars that you draw will reflect the um the underlying distribution right and this is sort of what, what this also then meant here so here we have to talk about um you're learning an underlying distribution from actually sampling data and then you have this distribution encoded and then you can sample from it okay and then the question is now Okay, let's um, wait. Sorry, let's say I have drawn this distribution. I say this is what I what I want. This is what I think is like represents well the the, the input data that I know of. Then how do you actually like choose from? How do you sample from this distribution? Let's say you want to sample hundred times, and in in the sample set you want uh, that uh, you know this value is roughly as likely as this and. And, and this value here is double as likely as, as this value and so on and so forth. Okay, and this is actually not hard. So what you do is the following. You um, uh, choose a, a precision. So in this case, I have chosen one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like like 15 or so, um, like grid cells here, right? So th this is the first you could say this is the first block, this is the first pink block, and then there's a green block, and then there's a following a pink block, and then a bigger green block, and then another uh, pink block, and so on and so forth. So this would be then the, the highest corresponding, and so on and so forth. And then you um, you just you draw the this this uh, the heights here, like this green line, um, and stack them after one after the others, right? So um, you start with and this is not very uh, nicely drawn but you start here with um with uh, a little bit of um of pink and then you you ha have a green line there and after the green line follows a, a pink line which is double as as high roughly here right so this line here is supposed to be double this and then an even longer greener line and then add follows a, a pink line which is roughly as as long as this right so you see the length or the height here corresponds to the length there uh, you know I, I could have drawn this picture better but for example here this is the biggest uh, value the the, the uh, most likely individual values like here you know we said this is the color red and so this is also the biggest block here and so we stack them after an, uh, one another here on this line and now we have uh, redu uh, reduced the problem of sampling from this distribution just to sample a number between 0 and 1, right? Because if you now uh, find a way of sampling a number between 0 and 1, you know, let's say you land here, you know, let's say this is like 0 0.688 or something like that, um, let's say here, then uh, this will correspond, this value here, this on the black line that you sampled, will correspond to some value on this um 
on this like partitioned grid line and let's say you have this value here then you choose uh, this this thing here and let, you know let's say a sample again from a number between zero and and one let, let's say I land here I happen then to get this thing and the thing is that because the the height or under the the curve here um, corresponds to a longer line here right so for example this line here is fairly long while this is like not even half as long the likelihood of landing on the longer line is naturally higher than long, landing on a shorter line right so and if you sample thousand numbers between zero and and one then you end up more often in the bigger ones but you still end up in the smaller ones as well like just by chance and in this way you've you've sampled from this arbitrary curve right so we are going to see this in, in an implementation. I will, you know, not drag on the video too long. I will step through it fairly quickly. But this is the idea of how you can get from a random number between zero and one to a general distribution, right? And of course, you know, this might go. In, we, we saw in the histogram here. Uh, this this went from zero to twenty-five. Um, we stack this and we we scale it down to zero and one, right? The normalization. How long this is doesn't really matter. Um, however long it is, uh, we normalize it um, if we don't have a normalized distribution already. And uh, so the the next thing then is how do we get um, a number between 0 and 1? And this basically is also simple just by going by binary representation, right? So if we have a mechanism to uh, discreetly sample uh, heads or tails, right? If I flip a coin and I get a bunch of heads of tails, like say I flip 15 coins, and then to get any number here on this, in, uh, any real number or rational number really, um, in this interval, I just um, do the simple trick of like always like um, making the coin flip decide which half I go in, right? So if the, if let's say heads is zero and tails is one, and I have like heads, heads, tails, then it means first interval I, uh, you know I did take the whole thing I divide it by two I go to the first interval we say it heads so and another heads we go we, ha we have this again and then tails we had take the second half so we'll, we'll end up somewhere here and if you say tails 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 heads heads tails then it will be this half this half this half and you know depending on uh, like the whatever binary coin flips come up you just um, uh, go to the certain half of this of the line deeper and deeper down and then in, th in this way you get some small uh, rational number there we will see this in the implementation as well i hope that wasn't too quickly but in this way if you have um, enough like coin flips then you can get a real number and if you have a real number then you can sample from a distribution with the stacking process and this is the way you sample um, from um, you, you can sample from this one dimensional distribution. It is not obviously not the, the most efficient way, but this is like a straightforward way. And the point also with then uh, the, um, the entropic thing is that this is basically the opposite. This is not uh, like doing implementation upon implementation and um, uh, writing code to go from one random number to the other and um, doing this direct computation. But here the, the idea is in this physics based stuff is that you take a physical process, the physical process itself uh, is noisy according to a distribution which you want to tune to be of interest to you, right? So for example, maybe you find a physical process that looks like this, and then you actually sample from the physical process and get your, your data in this way directly, and you don't have to do any of these computations that I just talked about, right? So, um, and the this chip here, uh, in, uh, in that approach is, is really just about this um, being in the in the position to um, to fix uh, distributions um, of which you can you know um, estimate by just the, the physics of it and then applying voltages and, and measuring I don't know what the other voltages so input voltages changes the parameterization of the distribution then you make other measurements which are then the measurement values and this way you sample from it sorry you sample from it and then uh, that you use somehow in uh, the energy-based 
uh, models. I have this super like trivialized situation where I just want one value and I said it represents a color, but this is obviously just, you know, a, a motivation. Um, the uh, energy-based uh, machine learning models are like much older and studied and um, uh, a little bit smarter than that, <laughs> obviously, but we're, uh, we're not going to get there in this video. Um, okay, so uh, let me uh, jump into the code. I will start uh, showing you what we do there. So um, if I run this thing, well, let me see. Okay, so this is the code um, that we're going to go through. I will run it first once and then I explain uh, the implementation, okay? So uh, what happens here, I start the, um, the, the, the run and my goal, my first goal is to get these coin flips, right? So how many coin flips do I generate? Uh, let's say 15, okay? Um, and what, how I generate the coin flips, what, what is my random number generator for this simple script that I wrote? Um, I just uh, look at the clock what's the time, right? Look at what are the milliseconds and I take the last digit of the milliseconds and just see if it's odd or even. If it's even, zero, if it's odd, one. And the thing is that this is basically random in a sense that like half of the um, samples will land zero and half of the one other ones will la land at one because I cannot control the millisecond uh, in which I sample this data, right? So I run the script um, and the, it tells me the time, right? This is like some um, U, uh, Unix represented represent the time there. So let's not worry about the values. What I can tell you is these are the seconds. These are the sub-seconds, second values. And I actually look at the millisecond value here. So I look at this eight here. This is the millisecond digit. And then I just mod to it. So this is an even number, so I get z uh, zero, right? And so the first value that I sampled was just the this this uh, the parity of this digit here. And if I printer enter again, which I do now, then it does the thing again, and it will do it 15 times. And every time I, I press, right? So 40 seconds pass between my first and my second sample. If I press again, then 10 seconds pass again two seconds passed, one second passed, and so on. You see here, these are the seconds, right? Something 80, something 90, uh, and so on. So I've sampled now five times, and they correspond to five different milliseconds, which are basically random because I cannot really control the intervals in which I press this button on a millisecond level. And that, in this way, I have a bunch of digits as well. So right, I will finish this, so I sample these values. So. Um, and you see, I have a bunch of zeros and ones here. And uh, sorry, and he here you see the, the values that I have eventually sampled, right? Uh, you will see this in the code, how this is done. So um, in the end, only five of the 15 um, digits came up um, as one, and I have like 10 zeros and five ones. And I, I can do the same again. Let me just repeat the same process just so you see how that is random. I will press this button 15 times. And in this case, I have eight out of 15 came up as one and seven came up as zero, right? So I, I get this, this sequence of digits just by pressing this button. And what do I do now? Now uh, I, I want to take these digits and make it uh, like turn it into a real number between zero and one. So this is uh, what you see here. So um, at first I start with the uh, X value uh, zero here, right? Um, and the first uh, number came up zero. So the first uh, digit here came up as a zero and then one, one and zero, zero, zero. And so I, I don't add one half, but the second value came up as a one. And so I do add one fourth and then the X value is um, one fourth. And then uh, it came up again as one. So in this case, I add one eighth. I end up with this number. Then there comes a bunch of zeros. I add nothing. And then I'm already, you know, every time uh, a one comes, I add a certain power of two which gets smaller and smaller. And in the end, after applying all these 15 numbers, 
I end up with some um, with some uh, floating point numbers. And actually, since the floating point numbers is not um, so, um, since the representation is not so deep, uh, I don't even need 15 digits in, in reality, right? So if I take eight or whatever, then I get as deep as I want to get. But so this is the number I sampled, right? With just the hitting enter, flipping the coins, I sampled 0 0.3826 and so on and so forth and, and so on. And then in my code, I will do this distribution here, this uh, histogram. So the histogram is uh, like similar to what we had here. Uh, some curve. Um, in my case, I have only seven values. I say the first one should be ha be have a heavy weight, the last one should have a heavy weight, and then the, f the f uh, fourth one as well, and the other ones kind of uh, not so much. And so this is my distribution that I want to sample from. And obviously, right, I could take any function here, right? I could take any function, put it on a grid, and and use this. This is just some random thing. And so according to this histogram, this is a representation of the histogram there, um, uh, like 18% or 19% um, of it is like, um, according to the index one, like it has 18% uh, of the weight of the histogram. And the last uh, value seven, it actually has eight uh, indices. The, the last value seven has like one third of all the um, of all the weight, right? This just means the last value is just very weighty. This is basically uh, one third of this. So this is basically, these will uh, um, sum up to 60 or something. And um, so having sampled this number X, uh, it, lend, it ends up somewhere, right, if you remember my, my drawing, the, the number that we have sampled x with the coin flips ends up somewhere here. And um, according to this, then, you know, in my case, the last and the first one have a very, like, thick bar, and uh, there's some mean bar in the middle. And if I if we just follow this, then this number 0 0.38, so this will be roughly here, um, this uh, happens then to select the value three, right? And in this way, I have sampled from the from the histogram just by pressing enter. Let me do this actually again. So I run this again: zero 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 one 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 zero 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 one one zero and up. And in this case, I have sampled from the I have sampled the the zero of index here, right? So that's that's how it works. I actually also have a cheating function, so if I don't want to press enter, uh, I just comment this here out, and I, I do it basically. Um, I use the, the 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 Python library to sample zeros and ones instead of um, hitting enter myself, and I do this twenty times. To, so the advantage of not having to do this manually is I can do it more often. And if I run this, then it does everything automatically, right? And I. Opa. and I get all these samples. So these are 20 samples drawn from the histogram according to my algorithm. And you can see, right, so uh, roughly one third of the time here, I get the seven and then I get a bunch of zeros and a bunch of threes and the other ones can show up, but very rarely, right? Let me run this once more. And this is very similar, right? So here, the number five showed up two times in a row, which actually only has 14% chance. And um, what is interesting here, the number two, which has 4% also showed up two times. So this is in proportion, it makes sense. Okay, so let me quickly walk through the implementation of this algorithm, right? You have seen now how it works, what it does. So first I have this function, which just um, takes the moment in time, right? I, I import the random library for my cheetah version and the, the time library to uh, sample the current time on my machine, you know, what my machine thinks, what the Unix time is. What this, this gives me, you know, the, the format in which this returns the time uh, is, do I plot it here? Um, apparently I don't. I don't. Ah, sorry. I have to scroll up a little bit. Um, I have to scroll up to the place where I... 
sorry. Since I, I sampled 20 times, uh, it's spammed with the automatic one. Let me do it once more in the manual way. So, so the time format that I get is this thing where you have one integer, then dot, and then another integer. This represents the seconds since they started counting, and then here milliseconds. And so what I do is I take this time, I cut it where the dot is. This is this split here where the dot is. I take the second, uh, the subseconds um, part of it. I take the third. Uh, element which is the milliseconds uh, digit I cast it to an integer and then I compute the digit actually by doing just mod 2 and I, this way I get my digit from t the sampling the current time and then how does it work with the hitting enter thing right so here I say how many digits do I want let's say 15 uh, do I want to cheat with the random library make a for loop if I want to cheat then I just use the, the choice function um, with the random library. If not, then I use the uh, function that I've just implemented. And then I put here input, which makes it wait till I do something, in this case, till I hit enter. Okay, so this is how I sample my digits. Then uh, the unit interval real, right? I, I, I give it a list of digits and I sum up just powers of two, right? So one half plus one four, one plus eight, and so on and so forth. And I leave out uh, the digits which are zero and I put in the digits which are one. So this happens then automatically like this. I plot the summons and then it is where I get the real number. Um, and then uh, the the drawing of a sample, right? So here I can explain one, one more thing. So here um, I said, you know, you put the bars, um, the greens and the pink bars um, in a line and the, the longer bars automatically get more volume on this grid line, right? And what we're actually doing here is uh, this value here, for example, here in this green line, this is actually like the value here is actually the integral from here to there, if you think about it, right? Because if I take the integral, the volume under this curve, then I, I get more stuff the longer this bar is. And this actually exactly corresponds to going along on these things, right? So integrating up this distribution gives me this, uh, the, 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 um, like the, the, uh, tells me how, how much I covered, like how far I am, if I um, translate it to um, how far I am along with these bars, right? So you, um, I hope that sort of makes sense, right? So the, uh, depending on where I am here, then everything that's on the left side corresponds basically to the, to the volume there. Um, so what I, what I really do here, like if I do the sampling thing is I just search the correct point on the, uh, on the integral of the, uh, of the histogram. And that's, that's this picture. This is actually this, um, cumulative distribution function, right? So I have the, the probability distribution, right? The, this is the histogram in this case, uh, they just took, um, a Gaussian in this case, but this, this would be any histogram there. And then if I integrate up everything to there, then I get the, this, um, this uh, red line. And so if I um, choose um, 0 0.8, right, then um, this is this height, uh, then this would then correspond to, to, to this bar there, right? So this is like how, how you find um, the the, uh, how far you get along the distribution. I hope this sort of makes sense, right? Probably the uh, cumulative distribution function way is now a little bit more complicated than uh, this line, like f just throwing darts at the line. But you, you can see how this translates to doing the same thing, I hope. Don't want to hold myself up with my bad explanation here, but okay. Um, and so, uh, so I have to do this integral, right? I have to, I have to put the, the, the histogram on the line um, taking one block after the other, right? Taking this block here, taking this block there, and this is the sum of all these blocks. And so this is what I do um, here. So all, like this is the cumulative distribution uh, function uh, as, um, as another histogram. And every entry sums up all the lines 
uh, till, the, till that point. So the, I take the histogram. This notation means I take everything which is uh, b um, below this index n plus 1. So for example, this is the first one, second one, uh, third one, fifth one, sixth one, seventh one. If I choose the index 7 here, for example, then I must uh, t I take the integral over all these things and I end up in this picture here. Okay, so I don't know if th this makes any sense, but you can see that this is sort of the translation of this idea, right? Of this this drawing idea. Um, and then uh, once I have this, once I have the um, this image, sorry for jumping around. So once I have this uh, this bar, then I can just take my random number and find out in which interval does it lie here on this on this integration uh, line. And uh, that's why I just loop over all these intervals and see hey, when is the, the x value um, that I have inside of this of, of two bounds. So this is the, the the lower bound and the upper bound. I should have called this U B um, more correctly. So so lower bound, upper bound. Um, and then um, I return mm, the index corresponding to the interval. So if my index is uh, here and with the for loop and I find, oh, the x happens to be inside of this in of this interval then i return the index corresponding to where where i found it okay sorry <laughs> um yeah and uh these are all the functions that i implemented and here um, everything comes together basically i define which histogram am i interested in i sample it i get all the digits um and then i um in this case there's just this one sample of 15 coin flips I compute my x value from it. I use the x value and the histogram to uh, draw a sample from using the cumulative distribution function. And then I get the sample. And this is how I get finally this value in this case. Okay, so I hope that made sense. Um, now, um, coming back, like now we have, we have seen like how complicated uh, and uh, sort, of, sort of unnecessarily complicated this is, right? I used uh, the the whole computer where all the the zeros and ones are, um, where the physics is controlled so that all the um, zeros and ones are nicely represented and stable and the circuitry um, does its magic, let me compute. And I abstractly represent these distributions and the zeros and ones and I have to do a bunch of arithmetic just to get these values. And then I have to push it through um, some um, smart cumulative distribution function computation just to re represent some distribution that I actually want to sample from, right? There's a lot of like overhead, not just in my script, but also on, in the machine because everything that I use is like deterministic stuff apart from me hitting the keyboard. And so now the idea is that if, if you want to sample, why not have the, a physical process actually represent the distribution that you uh, want to draw from and you don't have to code up the distribution you don't have to code up and work together with some random number that is like munched together somehow but actually this this distribution should be like an actually uh, the distribution according to for example some noise in some process or so, some thermodynamic distribution right and so uh, this one example here um, is is um uh, Brownian motion. So what you see here is there's some bo uh, box and there's these pink particles and then there's these white particles which are like pushed around by the small ones. If you go on the um, on the Brownian motion side, you see this picture here. So for you to understand this, uh, basically this video is for people who don't know any physics but um, might help. So what you have here is there's a box of, um, of small particles and this, the whole thing has a fixed temperature, and maybe this is completely a closed system, so the temperature stays uh, as it is, but the small particles, they tackle each other here in this chaos and transfer energy all the time, right? So if, we, if you have this glass and then I have this this etui and they, 
I throw that A2 E on the glass, then there's some momentum which is like transferred, and then maybe the A2 E which I threw will um, uh, not have as high a velocity anymore, but the glass has more velocity and so on. So these basically tackle each other, transfer um, um, kinetic energy. And so what was observed, I don't know, 150 years ago, is that if you have this liquid with these small black particles here, and then uh, some grain or this is some other bigger particle, like this, I think this historically was some plant particle, and these were some other um, particles in the liquid. I don't know exactly which materials they were. But th here's like uh, these this small ones, they tackle, you don't really see it good well on the video, um, but these, these small, and this gets even more chaotic, there's a lot of collisions of the small black ones with the with the yellow one, and the um, if the yellow um, particle gets a kick from the right, then that just means the the, the yellow thing will go to the to the right, and if you go, go get one from the top, then it will go down, and so on and so forth. So this is basically the motion of the yellow thing is controlled by the by the small black ones, right? And so you can then um, if you have an idea how uh, the black particles behave and what the, the energy transfer is and so on and so forth, then you can do this Einstein stuff, like he's famous for this um, Brownian motion paper. And you can basically have a theory of how uh, is the motion of the white, uh, of the yellow thing affected, right? And now um, I just want to talk about, uh, this is like a two dimensional uh, example, but let's talk about Brownian motion, like just left or right, right? So I'm just interested in how far is this particle moving either to the left or to the right. And then if you do the math, um, you find out that at the beginning, like if you drop the, the yellow thing in the middle, then you know, okay, this yellow particle must be in the middle. And then because it's suspended and like randomly hit and you don't, you cannot predict wh where it is hit from, you cannot predict all the motion of the small black particles, but... Uh, this thing is hit from the left and right, you kind of, over time, lose the information where this thing is, right? If you look away for like a few seconds, then probably the yellow thing moved left or right. It is, was hit, we don't know how it was hit. And the, um, the, um, the uh, diffusion of a Gaussian represents very well uh, your, the information that you have, right? B basically, at the start, you have b you have more this uh, this blue uh, distribution where you say, "Oh, I, I know that at the start it is where I dropped it because I just dropped it." Like in this case, I think in this picture, uh, zero point uh, one, let's say seconds, okay. And then it, uh, if you look away, mm, sorry, if you look away uh, twice as long, um, then um, the thing could have moved already further out through, through the being tackled by the black particles. And so um, it's more likely that uh, it's more now further out than it was before, right? And so this thing gets flatter and flatter, but as you can see, uh, the, um, the relative information that you have where it is becomes like weaker and weaker, right? So um, after uh, here, these two seconds or whatever pass by, um, then whether the, the, the yellow thing will be at uh, minus three or minus two, you basically have the same you, you, like guess, uh, like it's almost equally likely as far as you're concerned, right? Because you, you basically have the no more inf no more information and this goes for all of these, these distances across the board. Okay, I hope that makes sort of sense. Um, but the idea is now, there is a physical, like the main thing about this Brownian motion thing is, there is a physical process that literally represents um, a distribution, right? I, I don't have to actually implement and compute around, you just have this physical process where just by the physical laws, this follows on distribution. And if you suspend this yellow thing in the middle and then wait uh, two seconds and then do repeat this a million times, then you will actually also uh, and, and see you know, how far from the center is this is this yellow thing now uh, two seconds after I, I um, you know let it go. Then what you will find is that that the positions that you measure will follow this distribution, right? So now you can think of okay, what other physical systems can I tune 
to follow a certain distribution. And then after, after I have tuned the, the physical system in, so, so in, in a sort of this state, which has like, uh, like a thermodynamic uncertainty anyway, from like in, in the same sense in, in, in which the prominent motion thing, this, uh, thing this, um, has like an uncertainty. And then by measuring the thing repeatedly, you're basically just drawing samples from this underlying physical distribution, right? So that's, that's sort of the idea that you actually use the physics to draw samples and you don't have to do any computation. You just have to do the measurement. You don't have to do any fancy translation between distributions, but just do the measurements here. And so here, this is a more like advanced variation of this thing where you don't just have this um these big particles uh, suspended in the liquid with the small particles but you also like tie them together like you have actually three big ones and they are all tackled all the time and then you have some um some connections between them and depending on which connections you do here the thing will behave di differently right so if these are actually very loose um feathers how do you say um springs if these are very loose springs then, then uh, the white thing being hit by the small thing can uh, m actually make the the white thing still wiggle, even though it's it's like um, connected to the other one with the spring. And and if this this thing uh, the the small particle here hits this and this is connected, then actually this particle hitting the white one here will actually drag this one here also along over the the spring, right? So by choosing designing the setup you um go away from a gaussian you get some other strange distribution right and so you can actually manipulate the physics by by de designing something and then computing oh what does the how does the distribution after some time have to be and so you you design your physical system and then you measure the physical system and then you sample from a different kind of distribution right so this this is the, the idea and then uh, here, they don't use springs or liquids or Brownian motion, but they have some chip where they control the the, um, the distribution of s electrons. Um, I suppose some property of the electrons, maybe some proxy for the uh, position or uh, velocity. Um, I think in the end, it's probably voltages or amperes or whatever. You, the control, the springs before are now the voltages that you use to to um, uh, control the the electrical elements like the junctions or whatever, and the measurement like so the control of the the system where how, how you change the fed the springs and thereby the underlying distribution you 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 um, you uh, manipulate with voltages and the the samples that you draw is um, are just drawn from the distribution uh, which we, from the underlying physical distribution and here um, what what the main ingredients are is that if you do the thermodynamics and this is like basically Boltzmann theory and um, uh, however it's translated to, into quantum mechanics you know they have you have then some states and the, the system is pretty much the same nonetheless there's the, uh, uh, like quantum statistical mechanics they they are all uh, usually for, of this sort of Boltzmann factor where you have uh, e to the and then some energy function divided by the temperature. So I don't want to go into the details here, but basically if you set up a system and have a, have, have a theory of how the system works, like the springs or the junctions and so on and so forth, then you can make a theoretical model of which underlying distributions you should expect there, right? And you say, oh, this has to be this and that complicated distribution. Like um, I think I have the restricted Boltzmann machine here. So this is also like a neural network uh, variant, also fairly old. And here is also like you design the system, and you design the so-called Hamiltonian or energy function. And um, just from the statistics of, of how things co are connected, um, you um, get uh, then some probabilities from which, in the end, you sample from. The observables are like follow some distribution, and the the parameters you can control some voltages influence the energy and thereby dis distributions and and the idea I suppose is you know I don't know but I I suppose you want to design a chip where you can very sharply control uh, what distribution um, are currently um, residing in the system 
uh, and you want to design it in a way where, that you can like that is parameterized in a way that you get a, a broad range of distributions. I don't know how broad it can be. Um, presumably, um, if, if the system is big enough, then maybe you have so many deg degrees of freedom that you can approximate m more distributions. I don't know. So this is a lot of the things which are unclear here. It's also unclear uh, for me, at least, um, from the this white light paper, what particular machine learning routines because the for some reason I go very hard in the machine learning direction, although it appears to me that this is a general chip where you can then sample from and it could in principle also be used to various other uh, algorithms, but they sort of advertise it and chill it quite hard um, in combination with machine learning, which makes sense because they are these uh, energy-based systems, but um, uh, I think it's not a necessity, but it's not clear like which examples they for algorithms they want to implement and how the Python code that, that they apparently they have uh, and might open source at one point um, takes these chips and wraps a machine learning routine around them. Okay, but uh, this is this is goes more off topic. But okay, so I hope this sort of makes sense. Sorry for uh, making this another um, 46 minutes, but I hope you got an idea on my, on my reflection on that. And um, I will uh, keep track of what they will release because it's uh, kind of interesting. I, um, I, 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 before I made this video, I watched an interview which was released yesterday um, and where they say they, 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 they feel like they don't have um, competition. Uh, although I wonder um, how difficult, I mean, it's, the, the thing is difficult, but I, I, I wonder for uh, like a big um, like industry scale uh, company, a competitor, um, once they figure out, hey, we can do this and that, how, how, uh, what, what their mode really is, if they are just, you know, a few dozen people. So interesting developments. And, and then also, um, to what extent this can be stable enough to be integrated in actual applications, uh, in particular machine learning applications. So we will see. Okay, take care.